Well, greetings, brethren. It's uh, really good to have this opportunity to speak with you here on the first holy day of the Days of Unleavened Bread, the very beginning of God's festival plan. God tells us back in the book of Leviticus, inspired Moses to write in Leviticus 23, that he told Moses, he said, Speak unto the children of Israel, verse 2, and say unto them concerning the feast of the eternal, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. God's festivals are holy convocations. They're commanded assemblies made holy by God. The first of these holy convocations is the weekly Sabbath mentioned in verse 3. Then, verse 4 mentions the feast of the eternal, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. So these are seasonal convocations. They began with the Passover, the 14th day of the first month, at twilight, or literally in the Hebrew, between the two evenings, that period between sunset and total darkness at the beginning of the day, the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Eternal. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. The first day you shall have put away, uh, you shall have a holy convocation, uh, you shall have no, you shall do no servile work. And then we're told that the seventh day was also a holy convocation, verse 8. Now back in Exodus chapter 12, we read of the institution of this particular festival season. God had spoken unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. Uh, God was preparing to bring his people out of Egypt. You remember the story. Many years earlier, Joseph had been sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers. And then ultimately, God uh, raised him up, brought him uh, uh, into a position of prominence, actually made him the number two man in the land of Egypt, right under Pharaoh. And as famine began to uh, encompass the surrounding areas, Egypt was the only place available to buy grain. And God worked circumstances out to bring Joseph's brothers and his father uh, down to Egypt, and so the whole family came to reside in Egypt. And, of course, that generation died. Uh, a new dynasty came to power in Egypt. And ultimately, the Israelites were oppressed. And as the decades went by, the oppression grew more and more severe. Ultimately, God raised up Moses and worked in Moses' life in a very special way. And at age 80, brought Moses back to Egypt after a 40-year exile and sent Moses to go to Pharaoh with the instructions from God, let my people go. Now, Pharaoh made a very foolish statement. He asked Moses a question, and he asked it in a certain way. He said, who is the eternal that I should let your people go? I don't know your God. Well, God gave Pharaoh a chance to be introduced over the course of the Weeks following, there was miracle after miracle, plague after plague that came on the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh got a chance to know who the God of Israel was, the true God, the real God, the God who is the creator, who controls everything. Now, God gave the Israelites instruction through Moses, recorded in Exodus chapter 12. This is the beginning of God's festival plan. God's festivals outline the very plan of salvation. And the uh, beginning of the festival plan is this festival season in which we now find ourselves, the Days of Unleavened Bread. Moses was instructed, first off, to tell the Israelites about selecting out a lamb. This was to be done on the tenth day of the first month. Uh, the lamb was to be kept up until the fourteenth day of the same month, mentioned in Exodus 12, verse 6, and then the assembly of the congregation of Israel was to kill it in the evening, to kill it at twilight, that period at the very beginning of the 14th. They were to take of the blood and strike it on the side post and the upper lintel of the door, and they were to roast the lamb, they were to eat it. And that evening, around midnight, they were told that the death angel would pass through the land of Egypt, and it would pass over every home that was under the blood of the Lamb. 
Only those homes that were under the blood of the Lamb would be passed over, exempted from death. And in every other home in the land of Egypt, the firstborn would be struck dead. Now, the Israelites followed those instructions, and the details of that is given in Exodus chapter 12. But this is important to understand. There are many who talk about the Passover and who understand the connection or the symbolism between the Passover lamb and Jesus Christ. After all, it's very plainly stated in John chapter 1 that when John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So, Many people understand that the lamb slain at the Passover represented Jesus Christ. And, of course, Jesus Christ, on the evening prior to his crucifixion, the evening of his final Passover with his disciples, uh, took the bread and he took the wine that was there at the Passover meal, and he gave it special spiritual significance. He took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, and he said that that represented his body. And then he took the wine and he blessed it and he told the disciples to all drink of the cup. And he said, this represents the my blood shed for you. But so many want to stop at that point as though that were the entirety of the plan of salvation. When God sent the death angel through the land of Egypt and he spared, he passed over the children of Israel. He passed over those who were under the blood of the Lamb. He did not do so just so that they could remain in Egypt and stay slaves to Pharaoh. That was the beginning of their redemption. That was the beginning of God's plan for them because He was bringing a people unto Himself to enter into a special relationship with Him and to ultimately enter into His rest to inherit the promises that He had made to Abraham. The whole plan of salvation was typed in what God did and was doing through the children of Israel. So the Passover does not represent the end of God's plan. It represents the beginning. Understand something. God takes the initiative in our lives. All of us find ourselves, as the Apostle Paul explains in the book of Romans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. None is righteous, no, not one, the Apostle Paul explains. We're also told that the wages of sin is death. So if the wages of sin is death, and we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, then we're all in the situation that everyone who lived in Egypt was in. The death angel was going to pass through the land, and every household was going to have uh, the plague of death strike that household. They were all under sentence of death. Every household, the firstborn, was to be struck dead. There was only one way to be passed over, to be exempted from death. And that one way was to be under the blood of the Lamb. So God takes the initiative in our lives, but God does so with the intent that we respond to Him. Now, as we come right on through here in Exodus 12, God instructed the Israelites that the day that he passed over uh, the houses, or that the death angel passed over the houses, uh, that they were exempted from death, that's where the name Passover comes from, that it was to be kept as a memorial, verse 14. But that did not represent the end of the story. Verse 15 goes on to say, Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put, or shall have put, is actually the sense of the Hebrew, you shall have put away leaven out of your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day till the seventh, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. In the first day there is to be a holy convocation. Verse 17, we are to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This we observe this, this Feast of Unleavened Bread because, God says, this is when I brought your armies, your multitudes, out of the land of Egypt. So just as the Passover represents our exemption from death, our being passed over by death, 
by being under the blood of the Lamb and therefore receiving that exemption from the death penalty. The days of unleavened bread that we're now celebrating remind us of God bringing Israel out of Egypt. It commemorates the Exodus, two different aspects. First is an exemption from death. Secondly is the Exodus out of Egypt. We're told that, verse 19, seven days, no leavening is to be found in our homes. Whoever eats that which is leavened, that soul shall be cut off. Verse 20, you shall eat nothing leavened, in all your habitation shall you eat unleavened bread. Now let's notice that there are three different aspects of the celebration of the days of unleavened bread. Three different aspects of this celebration that reminds us of the time when Israel left Egypt. And God uses Egypt as a type of sin. You and I are to leave Egypt. The Apostle Paul really explains the connection between the days of unleavened bread and the Passover back in the book of Romans. We'll just notice in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 8, perhaps as much as any other one verse in the Bible, this verse tells us, the meaning of the Passover, what the Passover is all about. Romans 5, 8, But God commends his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what the Passover is all about. God commends his love toward us. God took the initiative in our lives. He extended his grace. But you and I are admonished by the Apostle Paul and, and other places in the Scripture, but the Apostle Paul, in a very direct way, admonished his readers, don't receive the grace of God in vain. God takes the initiative, but you and I must respond to God's initiative in our lives. God has called us, and he has as his intent and purpose that we do something with that calling. Just as ancient Israel was to come out of Egypt, so you and I are to come out of this world. We're not to be part and parcel of this world. Jesus Christ talked about that. The, the uh, New Testament apostles, James, Peter, uh, John, all talked about that. The apostle Paul. James says, you can't be, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? John talked about in, in the book of 1 John that we can't love not the world, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's not of the Father, it's of the world. You and I can't set our affections on this world and on this age and be pleasing to God at the same time. We can't be in love with this world and its ways. We can't try to just blend in with the world and be part and parcel. Look like, act like, be like, just fit in with this world. Take our identity from this world. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. You see, the world passes away. John explains in the book of 1 John chapter 2, the world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God shall abide forever. You and I, if we are to inherit the promises God has for us, we must love those promises. Because unless we love what God offers far, far more than we love what the world offers, we will never forsake the world and turn to God. We read in Scripture of the contrast between Moses and most of the other people who came out of Egypt. You know, in Hebrews 11, in Hebrews 11, we're told that by faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You see, Moses chose to suffer reproach for Christ he esteemed that as far greater treasure than all of the treasures and riches of Egypt. Moses saw the perspective. What we're told of the Israelites is that by and large, as is brought out in the Psalms, that in their heart they turned back to Egypt. Moses forsook Egypt in his heart. Most of the people who left Egypt with Moses never truly forsook it in their heart. In their heart, they turned back. It's very apparent that many people 
many brethren who at one time sat in seats right next to us, who sat listening to the same sermons, who celebrated the same holy days, many of those who at one time celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread with us, have turned back in their heart to Egypt. In their heart, they never forsook Egypt. It's apparent because you know what we love, what's important to us. That's what we embrace. Abraham looked for a city that has foundations whose maker and builder is God. You know, those who are in love with this world, who are in love with this society, who want to blend in with it and fit in with it and be part of it. It's their world, their society. They're never going to turn loose of it until they turn loose in their affections. You know, we will not truly change our actions, our behavior, and our attitude until first and foremost we change what we love. We change what we set our affections upon. Because ultimately what we love, we follow and embrace. Paul explained that God takes the initiative. He commends his love toward us while we're yet sinners. Christ died for us. That's the significance of the Passover. We're told how that uh, God's love and God's mercy and how we're justified by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ we are reconciled to God, as Paul explains in Romans 5.10, by the death of his Son. That's the significance of the Passover. But if we come right on into Romans chapter 6, verse 1, we find the connection between the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. Romans 6.1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We can't continue in sin. We can't continue in Egypt. The death angel has passed over us. We've been exempted from death. But that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning. We're exempted from death so we can follow God. So we're now able to follow him out of Egypt to the promises that he holds out. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's not what grace is all about. Grace represents what God freely gives and bestows. But he gives and bestows those things for a purpose. God is calling us into his family to inherit life through him. So we are not to continue in sin. Now, if you remember, I mentioned a few moments ago that there are three aspects to the celebration of the Days of Unleavened Bread. Moses explained in, in Exodus chapter 12 that we are to put away leaven out of our homes. I suspect that all of you up uh, until, uh, you know, the days uh, preceding this uh, have been uh, cleaning and gathering things up and looking for uh, leavening and, and getting it together and getting rid of it. He tells us that we are to remove the leavening, that the leavening is to be uh, on the first day, we shall have put away the leavening from our homes. So there are things we're to get rid of. But that's not all there is to celebrating the days of unleavened bread. It's not just you get rid of the leavening, but then we're told that for seven days, seven is God's number of completion and perfection, has a, a significance and is used in a significant way, a symbolic way through Scripture, that for seven days no leaven is to be found in our homes. But then there is a third aspect. We're told that for seven days we are to eat unleavened bread. It's not enough just to get rid of something. It's not enough just to get rid of what uh, is customary or has been a part of our lives. We are to replace it with something. And this is a vital aspect, and this is really something that I want to focus on in the remainder of the sermon as to what it is and what is entailed what we're to learn from ingesting unleavened bread through these seven days. We're to get rid of the leavening. We're not to eat leavening throughout this seven-day period. But from a positive standpoint, we are to eat unleavened bread. Now, let's go back to the book of John, and let's learn from Jesus Christ himself. Let's learn from a specific incident in his life and some specific teaching 
about the spiritual significance of eating unleavened bread. John chapter 6 uh, picks up the story where, uh, as we read in John 6, verse 1, that Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, and a great multitude followed him. They saw his miracles that he did. Uh, he healed people. And he went there into a mountain near the lake. And when he sat down with his disciples. Now, we're told this is one of the few incidents that is mentioned in every one of the gospel accounts, the feeding of the 5,000. And that is given in all of the, uh, all four of the gospel accounts. Most, uh, ma many incidents are mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, and yet John, only on rare occasion, tells of an incident that the other three had mentioned. But this has very special significance, and John adds in details that the others don't. While all of the Gospels mention the, feed, the incident of the feeding of the 5,000, John is the only one who ties it in with the holy days. And what we find in the Gospel of John is that every incident of Jesus' life that he records, virtually everything about Jesus that he records, John ties in some connection with one of God's festivals, one of the holy days. Here we're told that the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. It was getting close to Passover, and Jesus was there, and we read the story of this miraculous feeding of the 5,000, the loaves and the fishes being multiplied. Now, the, we're told in verse 14 of John 6, when those men, uh, when they had seen the miracle or the sign, literally, they saw the sign that Jesus did, uh, they said, this is of a truth, that prophet which should come into the world. That prophet, which is a reference that goes back to the book of Deuteronomy and is a reference to the Messiah. Jesus perceived that they would take, uh, come and take him by force to make him a king. He, he could see they were getting all excited. They were ready to march on Jerusalem. And so he just went up into a mountain uh, by himself alone. And after evening had come, and you put the other Gospels together, and you find he had instructed the disciples and told them to go ahead and take the boat and pass over the uh, uh, Sea of Galilee, go on over to Capernaum. When evening was come, uh, the disciples were out in the boat at sea, and uh, uh, after dark, uh, Jesus hadn't come to them, so they went ahead and left, and uh, they got in stormy waters. A storm came up there that evening, and uh, uh, they looked up here, and an amazing sight. You know, you can just imagine, here they are out in the boat, and, and these are not novices. These are men who are commercial fishermen. They're used to handling boats. They're used to the water. Uh, but this was a frightening storm, and the boat was tossing and turning, and the wind was blowing, and the waves were, were uh, uh, coming up. And all of a sudden, they looked up, and here was someone coming walking on the water. Well, you can imagine how frightened they were. And mentions that, tells the story in all of the accounts. And I uh, came near and Jesus said, well, don't be afraid, it's me. He came on into the boat. Now, what we find is that the next day, the people were looking for Jesus. And they saw the boat was gone. The disciples were gone. They couldn't figure out where he was. And, and uh, eventually... Uh, they got some other boats, uh, and they came, as we're told uh, in uh, verse 24, they came to Capernaum looking for him, trying to figure out where he was. And when they found him, verse 25, on the other side of the sea, they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? When did you come? We, we saw the disciples, and we saw their boat, and uh, it seemed like they left without you. How did you get over here? There weren't any other boats. Jesus didn't tell them how he got there. Uh, he went sort of to the heart and core of the matter, and he said, look, you're not seeking me uh, just simply because you saw signs that demonstrated my messiahship. You uh, are seeking me because you got a good meal. You ate loaves and fishes, and you were filled. You had a nice meal. Now, he said, I'm telling you something. Don't labor for the food that perishes but for the food that endures unto everlasting life. Now, let me call your attention to something. We're told that this incident occurred just prior to the Passover. Uh, we see this miracle. We see Christ crossing over the uh, uh, walking on the water and catching the boat and coming on over to Capernaum. We find that uh, 
Uh, later, others came on over. When was Jesus talking to these people? When was uh, the, these things that we're going to look at here in John 6, the, this explanation that Jesus gave? Notice in verse 59, John 6:59. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. As you go through and read John 6, I think it's very apparent that what he is telling them in John 6 was a message that he gave on this day, the first day of the Days of Unleavened Bread, a message that he gave in the synagogue in Capernaum to people who had just a matter of a few days before experienced the miracle of miraculous bread and fish, a miraculous meal. Jesus then began to explain to them about the real meal, what it was that they should really be eating. You know, Mr. Meredith has used the expression about feeding on Christ. And as we go through here in John chapter 6, that's one of the things we're going to see. When we eat unleavened bread throughout the seven days of unleavened bread, and that seven days represents entirety, completion, we are representing the fact that we are to be continually throughout our Christian life feeding on Jesus Christ. Notice here in John chapter 6, Jesus talked about uh, the fact in verse uh, 33, uh, the bread of God is he that comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. The bread of God is he that comes down from heaven to give life unto the world. He said in verse 38, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. You know, one of the hardest things to turn loose of in our lives is self-will. We want our way. Jesus Christ absolutely, completely turned loose of self-will. He said, I didn't come down to do my own will, to pursue my way, to do what I want. I came down to fulfill the will of the Father. He was absolutely, completely, unconditionally surrendered to the Father. So, he went on to explain in verse 48, he said, I am that bread of life. I'm the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Jesus Christ gave himself as a sacrifice. He said that we are to eat of the bread that comes down from heaven. I'm the bread. You see, the Jews got upset. Verse 41 says they murmured at him because he said, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven. They said, why? What, what do you mean by that? Why isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? Why, we know his father, we know his mother. How can he say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus said, don't murmur among yourselves. Verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. No, he said in verse 47, truly I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. I am that bread of life. I'm the bread of life. I'm the living bread. So he went on and talked about that we are to eat of him. He that eats me, verse 57, he talks about that. The bread that came down from heaven, verse 58, not as your fathers ate manna and are dead, but he that eats this bread shall live forever. This is what he taught in the synagogue in Capernaum. This is what he taught at the Passover season, undoubtedly on this first day of unleavened bread. Now, let me ask you a question. Jesus Christ talked about feeding on the bread of life. He said, I'm the bread of life. Uh, he said that we are to, uh, um, as he explained back in verse 33, when he said, the bread of God is he that came down from heaven to give his life for the world. And they said in verse 34, Lord, give us of this bread. 
And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes on me shall never thirst. So Jesus Christ was the bread of life. We are to feed on that bread of life. What does that mean? How do you feed on Jesus Christ? How do you feed on the bread of life? Throughout these days of unleavened bread, as we partake of the physical unleavened bread uh, throughout these seven days, we are to be reminded every time we do so of the necessity of throughout our lives feeding on the bread of life. But how do you do that? It's not a matter of just picking up uh, something physical and putting it in your mouth. First and foremost, we feed on the bread of life by believing. By believing. We're told in John 6, 47, Truly I say unto you, He that believes on me has everlasting life. He that believes on me. Now, what does that mean? We feed on Jesus Christ. We feed on the bread of life by believing on Jesus Christ. Now, you know the Protestant world talks about that. You can tune in and hear a lot of Protestant preachers saying, all you've got to do is just believe. Well, what is it that you believe? And what kind of belief is it? Let's go back to John chapter 3. Notice what Jesus told this Pharisee, this ruler of the Jews, this man, Nicodemus. If you remember the story, at the first Passover season of Christ's ministry, and this was spoken here during the days of unleavened bread, John chapter 3 was. If you remember, John chapter 2 showed Jesus coming to Jerusalem at the Passover season. It's what we're told in John 2.13, the Jews' Passover was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This is the very beginning of his ministry. He found the money changers and the temple and all of these things, and he overthrew the tables of the money changers and he chased them out and told them, you know, uh, my father's house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. You've made it a den of thieves. Well, this created quite a bit of consternation among the religious leadership, but Jesus proceeded on to work signs and miracles. He healed people. He performed great signs and wonders uh, there in the temple complex during this time, so much so that we find in John 3 that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night, and he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent from God, for no man can do the signs that you do except God be with him. We know, we rulers, we Pharisees, we members of the Sanhedrin, we've been talking it over. We saw what you did in the temple. We saw you come in and you clean house. We saw you chase out the money changers. We also saw the miracles that you were. We recognize that you're someone sent from God because no person just on his own can come in and do this sort of thing. Jesus then began to tell Nicodemus something. He explained the answer to a question that Nicodemus hadn't even asked. He said, truly, I tell you that except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Now, that caught Nicodemus back because Nicodemus did not come to Jesus saying, Master, how can I inherit the kingdom? When you understand about the Pharisees and the ideas of the Jews at that time, you realize it had probably never entered Nicodemus' mind that he wouldn't inherit the kingdom. He was born of Abraham. He was a descendant of Abraham, the one to whom the promises were made, and obviously uh, he was on his way to the kingdom. And Jesus looked at him and he said, don't kid yourself. Being born of the flesh is not sufficient. You're born as a descendant of Abraham, that's all well and good. But unless you're born again, not a birth that is generated from below by a human father, but a birth that is generated from above, by our Heavenly Father, born again, a second time, born of the Spirit. Not 
born of the flesh right now. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. You and I are flesh and blood. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, we will be changed. This mortal will put on immortality. The flesh will be changed, transformed. In a moment of time, in a twinkling of an eye, we will step from flesh into spirit to be born again. Now, Nicodemus was sort of puzzled by this. Jesus went on to explain to him about God's plan and God's purpose. He said in John 3.15, Whosoever believes in him, and the one that God has sent, Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believes in him should not perish. God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The meaning of the Passover. He gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? Well, we're told on down in verse 36 of John 3. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. He that believes not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Believing the Son, not believing the Son. We saw uh, a little bit earlier in, in uh, John 6:47 uh, that he that believes on me has everlasting life. The uh, uh, Jesus addressed the subject further uh, in uh, John chapter 20 when, uh, as he explained here to his uh, disciples after his crucifixion, after his resurrection, we're told. Uh, the incident with uh, Thomas, uh, who had at first doubted, and because he had been there when Jesus had manifested himself to the others after the resurrection. And when they told Thomas about it, he said, I don't believe it. He said, you can't tell me he's alive. I saw his cold, dead body laid in the grave. I don't believe he's alive. He can't be. I wouldn't believe it unless I could put my finger into the wounds in his hand, unless I could stick my fist into that big gaping wound in his side. Fellows, he died. His blood poured out on the ground. I saw his cold, dead body laid in the grave. You can't tell me he's alive. Well, you know the story. A week later, they were there, and all of a sudden, Thomas was in the group, and all of a sudden, Jesus just appeared in the midst of them. Greeted them, and he said, uh, Thomas, I understand you've got a question. Come on up here. I want you to stick your hand in my side. I want you to feel the wounds in my hand. Thomas, you can imagine what went on in his mind. Thomas answered, and he said, My Lord and my God. He understood, he realized that he really did raise from the dead. Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe. This is John 20, verse 29. Blessed are they which have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. We feed on Christ by believing in Him. But what does that mean fully? Let's notice back in Romans chapter 10, because the world does not grasp what this kind of faith is really talking about. In Romans chapter 10, let's notice in verse 9. If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shall believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Notice verse 10. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart man believes unto righteousness. 
The kind of faith, the kind of belief we're talking about is not just an academic belief. It's not just uh, sort of saying something. You know, James explains something very important back in the book of James, chapter 2, that ties right in with this. James, chapter 2. And uh, we'll notice here um, in, uh, in verse 23, where it talks about uh, the Scripture was fulfilled. It said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. You see, the kind of faith we're talking about, you know, the Scripture says you believe. James said you believe there's one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. You, what was Paul talking about in Romans 10.10? 10? He said, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. When you believe it in your heart, it will change your life. The kind of faith that God is talking about, the kind of faith that we're talking about in believing on Christ, it's not merely just saying the words. It's not an academic belief. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it'll change your life because that's the most real thing that is. Just as his dead body went into that grave three days and three nights later, he came forth from that grave by the power of the Father. He ascended on high, and he's going to return to this earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. If you believe it in your heart, it will change your life because ultimately you and I act on what we believe. If something is real to us, if we believe it, then we act on that belief. If you and I don't live it in our lives, then it's very clear we don't believe it in the heart. Because with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. It produces results and changes in our life when we believe it in our heart. So to feed on Christ involves believing on Him in our heart, believing it from the heart, and it will change our life. Now, we feed on Christ by believing on Him. We also feed on Christ by dwelling or abiding in Him. Now, let's understand what that means. John explains it again back in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and, and verse 56 Jesus Christ said, He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. Dwells in me or abides in me. The same phrase. In fact, this exact same word is translated dwell, abide, endure. It has to do with remaining in Christ, with enduring in Christ, abiding in Christ, dwelling in Christ. Let's notice in John chapter 8. Jesus had explained some things. In verse 31, he said unto those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Now, this word that's translated continue here in verse 31 is the exact same word that's also translated dwell or abide elsewhere in the Scripture. Jesus said to those Jews that, believed on him. They professed with their mouth that they believed. But was it really believing it from the heart? No, he told them, if you continue in my word, you abide in my word, you remain in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You remain constant, steadfast in my word. In other words, you're following my instructions. You're living by the instructions that I've given you. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Uh, here we find Jesus said, we'll pick it up in verse 36. He said, I have greater witness than that of John, John the Baptist. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself which has sent me has borne witness of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time or seen his shape. You have not his word abiding in you. For whom he has sent, him you don't believe. Jesus told those Jews that they did not have the word of God abiding in them. They didn't have God's word continuing in them, remaining, enduring, dwelling in them. 
Because if they did, they would have been acting on it. You see, he told them, he said, search the Scriptures, verse 39. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are the they which testify of me. You talk about the Scriptures, and you say you believe the Bible, you believe the Scriptures. The Scriptures are the way to eternal life. Jesus told them, he said, well, search the Scriptures, because the Scriptures point to me. You don't have the Scripture abiding in you. You don't have my Word abiding in you. You're not abiding in me because you don't believe what the Scriptures say. Continuing uh, on down a little, uh, a little further here in John chapter uh, 6 and uh, verse 27. Jesus said, Labor not for the meat or the food which perishes, but for that food which endures unto eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give unto uh, unto you, for him has God the Father sealed. You see, this is that food which endures the same work, which continues, which remains, which dwells, which abides. So here we learn the, that there is food that endures, that continues, that dwells unto eternal life. To dwell in Christ means to abide in his word. In uh, Back in John chapter 15, Jesus said, I'm the, I'm the true vine, my father's the husbandman. And he went through and explained about that. In verse thir- uh, 4, he said, abide in me, and I in you. Same word. Dwell in me, remain in me, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch can't bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. The only way that you and I can truly bear spiritual fruit in our lives is to abide, to remain, to continue, to dwell, to endure in Christ. Which means having His Word dwelling in us. We're dwelling in His Word. His Word is dwelling in us. That has to do with our actions. That has to do with obedience to God. That has to do with keeping His commandments. If we're feeding on Christ, then we believe. And if we believe Him, believe Him from the heart, and that is a life-transforming, a life-changing belief. Because you can't really believe what God says. You can't believe the message Jesus Christ brought. Truly believe it in your heart and go on about your affairs in this world, being part and parcel of this world, as though this world and this society was going to continue on forever. That's not the way the men and women of faith live. When you read Hebrews chapter 11, these were men and women who were convinced that this world was going to pass away. They didn't love this world. This is not where their affections were. They didn't set their affection on this society, this culture. With all, and, and ultimately, this world's society, this world's culture, John was inspired to write, is based on three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Vanity, pride, the cravings of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's the value base that underlies this world, this civilization. He that, you know, if we love this world, then we will ultimately perish with this world. But we're called upon to renounce the world and to love God. To love the things of God. To put our trust, our confidence, our faith. That produces obedience from the heart. It is a life-changing, life-transforming faith. That's the kind of faith that Abraham had. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. When you go through and you read the account in the book of Genesis, you find out that Abraham acted on his faith. John 15 goes on to tell us, Christ said here in in verse 5, I am the vine, you're the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. Without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather uh, them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me, Remain in me, dwell in me, continue in me, endure in me. It's the same word. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, 
You shall ask what you will, and it'll be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. God wants us to bear godly fruit, but you and I can only bear godly fruit in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't generate that fruit on our own. Our own human obedience just based on, on sort of gritting our teeth and, and, and doing it. Well, you and I can't fix ourselves. We can't make ourselves into what God would have us be. Because you and I cannot transform ourselves from the inside out. Only God can. Abide in me. My words abide in you. God's word is here to cleanse us. It's to instruct us. It's to guide us. It's to point us. It is to enable us to know and to understand what is pleasing to God. We're to search for the mind of God. You know, sometimes God lays things out in a very clear-cut, very plain state. Other times, He teaches us by example. He teaches us by illustration. He teaches us in various ways. We're to search the Scripture trying to understand the mind of God. Trying to understand what would be the most pleasing to God. And the more we study and the more God's Word dwells in us, and we dwell in that Word and continue in that Word. That's what he's talking about. He explains that we are to abide in him. We're to abide in him. If we go back and just briefly note here in 1 John. 1 John uh, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 2. He talks about uh, abiding. He says that in, in verse John 2, verse 17, the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. This world, based on vanity and jealousy and lust and greed, based on the pride of life, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, this world is passing away. It's going to be relegated to the trash heap of history. This civilization, this culture, the value that describe this world are going to pass away. But he that does the will of God will abide, will endure forever. The, uh, the Scripture goes on uh, to uh, tell us that we're to let that abide in us, verse 24, which you've heard from the beginning. We're to continue in the Son and in the Father. Uh, he comes. He, he goes on, talks further about this in John, in First John three, and First John four, that uh, uh, tells us in First John three and verse four that whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. He was manifested to take away our sins. In him is no sin. Whosoever abides in him sins not. You know, as long as we're abiding in Christ, we're not sinning. If we're abiding in Him, continuing in Him, we're following in His steps. His Word is abiding in us. We're abiding in His Word. We're not sinning when we're abiding in Him. And we certainly can't abide in Him and follow the, the, the pattern or the practice of sin. We find over and over the, the uh, instructions and the admonitions in this regard. Now, we've looked at the fact that we feed on the bread of life by believing in Christ. We feed on the bread of life by dwelling in Christ. We also feed on the bread of life by living in Christ. We abide or dwell in His Word, and His Word abides or dwells in us. But notice also in John chapter 6 and verse 57, As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. We're to live by Christ. To believe on Him from the heart. To continue faithfully in His Word, filling our minds with His Word, feeding on His words, letting His words abide in us. We abide, dwell, continue, remain faithful in the Word. And we are to live by Him. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, in verse 4, He said, man, this is here as we uh, uh, read the temptation by Satan. And, and uh, Jesus answered, 
in Matthew 4 and verse 4 and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We're to live not simply by physical bread, by ingesting physical food. We are to live by the Word of God, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Notice as we would go back to the book of Romans, let's start here in Romans chapter 1. Romans uh, chapter 1, we pick it up uh, in verse 16. Paul writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and to also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So faith isn't just something that you believe, just sort of an academic list. Well, I believe this, and I don't believe that. The just are to live by faith. The kind of faith that is saving faith is a living faith. Real faith. Faith that produces works. Faith that produces results in our lives. The just shall live by faith. And we find here that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold back or suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. There's a lot of things that can be known and understood just from the creation, from the world around. The invisible things are shown. The just are those who will live by faith. Notice on over in a little further in the book of Romans, chapter 6, We read uh, Romans 6, verse 1 earlier. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Notice verse 2. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, we're either living in righteousness, living in Christ, or we're living in sin. And if we are dead to sin, how can we continue to live in sin? We're to live in Christ. Don't you know that as many as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Paul writes here in verse 3, We're buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We're to live a different way. We're to walk in a new way of life, a new way of thinking and functioning and being and doing, a newness of life. A transformation. You see, real faith will change our lives. True obedience, obedience from the heart, flows from living faith. To live in Christ is completely contrary to living in sin. If we live in Christ, we're dead to sin. Coming on back a little further in the book of Galatians, Let's just notice here in Galatians chapter chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You see, if we're truly Christ's, then the things that flow from the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the affections, the lusts that flow from the flesh have been crucified. We don't want to order our life. Why do we do the things that we do? What's important to us? What do we cherish? If we're Christ, we've crucified. The flesh with its affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let's walk in the Spirit. To live in Christ, to live in the Spirit, means we're walking in the Spirit. God's Spirit will only lead us in one way. It will lead us in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. 
just as explained in the 23rd Psalm. It will lead us in that straight and narrow way, which is found by few, not in that broad, wide path found by many, that doesn't lead to life, leads to death. To live in the Spirit is to walk in the Spirit. Let's go back a little further in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. We read here of Jesus Christ, as we're told in verse 21, even here and two were you called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He was not deceitful. When he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you're healed. We should live unto righteousness, being dead to sin, living unto righteousness. A surrendered life, a consecrated life, a life that is filled with and led by and motivated by the Spirit of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Apostle Paul explains in the book of Romans. Peter goes on here in 1 Peter chapter 4. In verse 1, he says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that suffers in the flesh has ceased from sin. In other words, are we prepared to suffer rather than sin? We're told to arm ourselves with the same mind, the mind of Christ. A mind that was determined to suffer rather than to sin. This is We need to have this mind, verse 2, that he should that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. If we continue to live our physical life, it's not to be lived and determined by the lust of the flesh, the pulls of the flesh, but by the will of God. For in the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in, in lawlessness, Walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the living and the dead. You see, we ultimately are to live according to God and the Spirit. This is why the gospel was preached even to those that are dead now, because they're going to be raised back up. God, When Christ returns, he'll judge the living and the dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God and the Spirit. We're to live according to him. Throughout these seven days of unleavened bread, as you and I eat unleavened bread, having put away the leaven, seeking to keep out the leaven. And yet, it's not enough just to get rid of sin. It's not enough just to get things out of our lives. We've got to fill our life with something positive. We are to eat unleavened bread. We are to feed on the bread of life. We are to feed on Jesus Christ. We do that by believing in Him from the heart, a life-changing, a life-transforming experience to believe on Him from the heart. We feed on Him by truly believing. We feed on Him by continuing and dwelling in His Word and having His Word dwelling in us. We we feed on Him by living in Christ, by walking in the pathway. As we go through these seven days of unleavened bread, as we eat the unleavened bread that is set before us, We're to be reminded of why Paul called it the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Because that unleavened bread points to Jesus Christ, the true bread of life. Let's feed on that living bread. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.